Remember when I said, are you <laughs> guys ready? Wait, where's my record <laughs> thing? Oh, there it is. Sharp production you've got here. Yeah, oh, I know. It's it's top notch. <laughs> yeah, it's the most This is almost as much of a disaster as show. Mariah Carey. <laughs> yeah. You guys ready? Yeah, oh, totally. Oh, my God. We have to talk about that. <laughs> have to talk about what? Mariah, Mariah Carey. Carey. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, cool, cool. I'm I'm in. Okay, so I got the chat up. Um, and... Okay, now I've like totally lost my train of thought because you guys aren't on the ball. <laughs> and <laughs> okay, hey everybody, it is episode seventy-five of At Percussion, and we're recording on the first day of two thousand seventeen. So happy New Year to everybody! And with me are my friends Laurel Black, hi, and Ben Charles. How's it going? Hi, everybody. So listen, our guest today has a comprehensive performance background in symphonic and solo percussion, as well as musical theater. He received his DMA from the Hart School and is the percussion coordinator at the University of North Alabama. So how's it going, Tracy Wiggins? It's going great. Happy 2017, guys. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, hey, you guys, how would you rate 2016 for yourself and also for the world at large if you have to give it a grade? Oh boy! <laughs> I, can't I give speak it a for solid the world at mind. large, but my year personally was great. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening. I, I thought to ask that because I was listening to NPR. I guess just yesterday, and one group of people were saying, "Oh man, it was such a, a drag of a year. Like Carrie Fisher just died, and all these celebrities died, and um, you know, the election was such a." controversial negative thing you know whether you're happy or sad about the results i think we can all agree man it was like really hard on everyone and it was so disappointing um and then someone on the other side says oh but it wasn't so bad like the cubs won and wait you're comparing (laughs) comparing like a sports team to like super major events that affect everybody and people dying so i don't know it was Mm -hmm. kind of frustrating to hear that what do you guys think yeah i guess like personally overwhelmingly a lot of good things um yeah like teaching at a university again and yeah um yeah just enjoying some nice um professional things but yeah certainly in terms of i guess like pop culture it was kind of disappointing and yeah it went out with certainly something disappointing to bring up (laughs) Miss Mariah Carey, that was the perfect <laughs> ending in 2016. <laughs> Poor thing. Laurel, you sound like you're a little hungover from last night. What's okay. going on? Laurel has um, had a cold for a little bit, and then Laurel has migraines that run in her family. So when she had two beers last night, she woke up this morning with a migraine. So hello, 2017. <laughs> yeah, Welcome. we did not. We did not party last night. We instead stayed home, and Laurel painted, decided to paint the bedroom. I did, despite feeling sick. And uh, yeah. then we went to bed at ten o'clock or something. It's pretty lame. Yeah, it was great. So I, I'm sure my voice is extra annoying today because it's I'm a little groggy and it's really hoarse. Yeah. So you were not actually up for Mariah Carey's thing then? Oh no, I watched it this morning. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, it blew up the internet. As basically as it was happening last night. So, wow. I so, mean, I, I mean, is it this? Do you guys have mixed feelings about it? Because part of me was like, oh, I feel so bad for her. That sucks. But then the other part was like, you know what? I don't feel that bad for her. <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think it, whenever this sort of thing happens, it, it always brings up the issue in, I, I guess, in pop, pop art, if we can use that as a term, of like people are paying to see a performance. Um, Mariah Carey singing nowadays, period, isn't a good idea, but singing in New York, New Year's Eve, cold weather is also a terrible idea. It's like, you know, if Yo-Yo Ma was performing on cello, would he really sound good in that either? So do we, you know, is lip syncing okay in that case? Or I don't know. (laughs) It seemed to me like there were, there was a certain part of the playback that she needed or was expecting. And yeah, the high notes in particular were definitely pre-recorded. Right. So those were there. And then whatever, maybe she was supposed to be singing along to herself. I don't know. Yeah. 
I, I guess my feeling, I honestly, I don't have a strong opinion about it. Um, I, but, but I, I also tend to think like it's your show and it reminded me of Laurel and I's faculty recital here. Laurel, uh, I, I played a few pieces. We played my concerto together. I left. Laurel stayed on at the piano and then she was going to play Body of Your Dreams by Jacob TV. And the track started not at the beginning, but kind of kind of towards the beginning, but a little a minute into it or something. And Laurel, I was watching on the monitor backstage. Laurel kind of like went, oh, what the what's going on? And then she she kind of started playing along. She found it. And and I just went, what? No. And I walked out on stage and I I went to Laurel's shoulder and I said, just a minute. It'll be okay. And I walked to the other end of the stage, opened the door, which you're like not supposed to do. We have, you know, we have all these specific rules of the hall and the stage and the stage management's all really specific, but there wasn't time to do that. It's like, no, this is my recital. This is my concert. Um, none of that matters. We're either going to yeah. do this right or not at all. So I, I was thinking, I was feeling really bad for her because it's out of her control, but I also felt like she should have just went, whoa, guys, wait, stop. Stop I everything. Think, I think the issue right is though, not do it. it's different on a faculty recital versus a live televised event when you're the last performance before the new year hits. <laughs> no, of course, of course. <laughs> but I'm saying rather than embarrass yourself and let, yeah, yeah. let, let your art go wrong, you just go like, no, no, it doesn't get done wrong. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of what she did. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I, she, she just, I mean, she she like sort of attempted to sing a couple times, and then she just stopped. She like she kind of danced, but she didn't sing. And uh, there I were reports that it was like maybe, maybe she didn't want to give a subpar performance because she couldn't hear herself. Well, and I hear, and I didn't get to see the whole thing, but I heard a couple of things like people saying that she had actually pulled the in ears out and was like trying to signal the guys to let them know that they weren't working and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I also read somewhere else, and again, I don't know how accurate this is, but th that said that one of the backing tracks was actually not even the track that was supposed to be playing. Mm. Like somebody had started the wrong track. And that, I think, is partially what might have sent it downhill, too. Mm. Yeah. Um, but um, Jim Riley, the drummer from Rascal Flats, made a post about it. And it was a really good post. He said, you know, I'm not here to bash her or anything. But he said, the fact of the matter is, this stuff happens in live performance, and the key thing is how you handle it happening in live performance. You know, and he, what he said is that the where she went wrong was that she handled it the worst way she could have probably have handled it at that point. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I think she should have. You know, you don't you don't try to like, you know, pretend or just kind of nod along and. Then it, no, I mean you stop everything and you take control of it. You're the you're the soloist. It's all about you, and yeah, you just you take over. You know, yeah, yeah. But Tracy, how was your 2016? Now that Ben I, and I have had a, a fight already. <laughs> uh, yeah, that start that started out. That's a great way to start 2017, guys. Yeah. Um, well, we we added a third little girl to our brood. So when you look at it from that perspective, it was great. Um, yeah, congrats. Yeah, we added her. And then, of course, I mean, it was, there's been a lot of really good stuff, like career wise. You know, my uh, playing with the Huntsville Symphony, like as an extra player on nearly every concert now is a pretty cool thing. Um, you know, doing the presentation at PASIC the same weekend that I was doing that at PASIC, our marching band performed at BOA. You know, so it was a lot of like really awesome stuff for my students and everything, too. A and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the year that you hired Lauren Teal. This is the year we hired Lauren Teal. That alone makes a year. Yeah, and La Lauren has been great. Um, she came in and hit the ground running because she literally came off a tour with the Troopers and walked into band camp here. So, <laughs> um, how do you know Lauren Teal, Ben? And who is Lauren Teal? Sorry, uh, I went to UNT with her. Yeah. Okay, she's the other percussion teacher here. Um, and then, so she's a UNT and IU grad, and then she's the she's the, actually one of only two female percussion caption heads in DCI right now. Oh, great! Um, and she is at the Troopers. So, so yeah, I mean that was a, that was a great hire. Um, you know, we just she's been exactly what we were looking for. 
to come in here for what we were needing for that position and stuff. So awesome. very cool. Well, great. Congrats. I think we should go ahead and <laughs> move to a topic. So let's do laurels. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, okay, let me grab my notes here. So t today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, something that we get lectured on constantly, which is like decibels, noise levels, hearing loss. Basically because at PASIC I oversaw the hearing tests that are offered every year. And then, um, you know, just looking around different articles online, I found some cool articles. So I thought I'd put all that together and present a little something to you guys. So the two articles from New Music Box that I'm going to use today are called That Which Cannot Be Avoided by Frank O'Terry and Turn the Volume Down Now by Bruce Hodges. I'll also mention a small essay by Barry Blesser, who's a PhD, called The Seductive Yet Destructive Appeal of Loud Music. So to start with a quote from Leo Tolstoy, 1890, he says, music makes me forget my real situation. It transports me into a state which is not my own. Under the influence of music, I really seem to feel what I do not understand, to have powers which I cannot have. <clears throat> so to start with the article from Barry Blesser, all he's talking about here are what seem to be the reasons that people still listen to loud music. So we know that there are different ways to lose your hearing, but we are musicians. And one of the most common ways is listening to music too loud or uh, practicing playing and damaging your ears that way. And he actually says or argues that loud music isn't an accident that arises out of ignorance, but that we actually have these uh, sort of subconscious reasons for listening to it, such as being uh, the result of being manipulated for commercial profits or as a temporary fad that happens to exist in our culture at this particular moment in time. Excessive loudness serves a function, and both of those things ring true for me when I think, you know, you're watching TV and suddenly a commercial is eight times louder than what you were just watching. It's the most annoying thing in the entire world. At first, he talks about ideas of aural space. So... In every environment, in sounds that happen within it, we create a sort of analogous visual horizon to which all other sounds are compared. So to start off with quiet music, if you're listening to something quiet, you're also able to hear the sounds around you, be it like your cat in the room or cars driving by or your heat coming on, something like that. You can hear other sounds that aren't the music specifically. But with loud music, all of that ambient and environmental noise gets drowned out. And in a way, the loudness almost becomes a sort of escape from our current physical environment, and it puts us in a different aural space. And he says, you know, that kind of goes into this basic primordial perspective where loudness equals intense energy because it has this ability to quote unquote transport out of a current environment into somewhere else. And that we find that incredibly stimulating. He cites a study which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that found that raising the loudness of music, uh, like a double shot of whiskey, the researcher said, elevates the intensity of any experience. Music interacts with, the brain, with brain substrates that are associated with rewards and emotions, and that music is a stimulant like caffeine, sugar, alcohol, anger, vigorous exercise, sexual activity, and many other things. Uh, loud music is simply a stronger stimulant than soft music. That idea was actually new to me because we all use music as sort of mood regulators or sort of a emotional vessels, you know, with whatever we're feeling. And sometimes you listen to something very calming and maybe tempo-wise, on the slow side of things because you need to calm down or you want to relax. But even so, music is still a stimulant. Even though it might be pulling you down in terms of how your brain receives it, it stimulates rather than depresses. That was very interesting to me. In a different study, researchers found that loud music activated those brain regions that are associated with euphoria drugs such as cocaine, 
There is evidence that music elevates endorphins connected with pleasure centers in the brain. We know that. Conversely, there is some evidence that when a person is exposed to high-level sound, the brain contains chemicals that are also found in patients diagnosed with schizophrenia. Interestingly, some musicians report that music that is too loud actually creates intestinal distress. So they have this physiological reaction to sound that is too loud. I'm going to always blame it on music now. <laughs> yeah, like brown notes. That's what he's talking about. Right, like, the, like South Park, the brown note. That's right, it's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, obviously that's not what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> of course, sociologically, loud music can create a type of group think among large groups because it can be such a communal activity. Even listening to it, you know, anytime there's a driving beat that uh, connects to the motor cortex in our brain, which is why people say listen to music when you run or work out because it helps you to keep going because it just connects to your motor cortex and just off you go. And you don't have to think about it quite so much. And that, that whole group think mentality and using loud music to get there has been utilized by so many different things. Just religious institutions started incorporating, you know, contemporary music into their services uh, because of this, as well as political rallies do this same thing. But of course, we know that different establishments do this also. Um, and this is a quote from uh, a New York Times article back in 2012. By playing loud, fast music, patrons talk less, consume more, and leave quickly. When a bar's music was 72 decibels, people ordered an average of 2.6 drinks and took 14 and a half minutes to finish one. But when they turned up the volume to 88 decibels, customers ordered an average of 3.4 drinks and took 11 and a half minutes to finish each one. So it actually does affect some of our behavior. <clears throat> in addition to sort of some of these uh, subconscious effects on our behavior of loud music, naturally uh, damage is part of that also. So over decades of listening, ear parts gradually age and deteriorate. This is just something we know that happens, but that's not the same as what the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, or the NIDCD, which is part of the National Institute of Health, refers to as noise-induced hearing loss, which they abbreviate as NIHD. And despite both multiple causes and multiple outcomes in different people, NIHD is preventable. So here's what happens like anatomically with damage uh, in this way. Lining the inner ear are microscopic sensory hair cells, which are topped with equally small projections called stereocilia. And when sound travels past them through the ear canal, they vibrate and channel that sound into the brain. But when sound overwhelms them, instead of stimulating them, they're overwhelmed and they wither and they die and they never go back. The NIDCD notes that 85 decibels is the tipping point, and that's an important number to remember for when I get going later on. <laughs> Music played at 85 decibels for a prolonged time will cause damage, and they say an MP3 player can go up to 105, which is obviously more than 85, <laughs> more than is healthy, and a classical concert may have peaks of 120, and your average rock concert will spend about the whole time around 150, which is rather alarming. I'm pretty lame, I guess. I don't go to a lot of rock concerts, but I don't enjoy them. The ones I've been to, I didn't enjoy because they were so loud. It was uh, just painful, you know, intestinal distress like they were talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's so good. It's like you're in a blanket of sound and uh -huh. w when the sound is good i mean the mix has to be good because i've had it where you know at a rock concert where you they couldn't turn it up loud enough you know it's like oh it sounds so good and you could just take more and more and more and more and more and then other times the mix isn't right it's not as loud and it just sounds horrible and it, you just want it you want to do nothing but get away from it yeah um, well and that's but yeah, exactly I always, what the guy what he said at first, like, it's like this escape. It's this experience that just oh, yeah. overwhelms you. Oh, um, yeah, it's very physical, yeah. Yeah. So now let me tell you guys about 
uh, some informal research that was done at PASIC by um, the faculty and students from Butler University who were there to administer the hearing tests. Um, when they had a little bit of downtime, they uh, went around the convention center to measure decibel levels. At PASIC 2016. At PASIC 2016. Yep. So remember, 85 is the the cutoff from when damage can start to occur. And I, I feel like I don't even have to tell you guys these numbers because everybody is already smiling and going like, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> well, I actually I actually remember talking to people at PASIC this year that all thought that it seemed louder in a lot of places anyway. Hmm. Um, I remember having that conversation with a few people. So I'm going to be interested to see what these numbers are. <laughs> yeah. So let's start, let's start with the big one, with the exhibition hall. Outside the hall, like at the entrance where they would check your badge, was 72 decibels. You walked inside the doors and went all the way up to 83. And of course, those first few booths are the quote-unquote more quiet booths. <laughs> You know, no cymbals, no drum sets, anything like that. But it still stayed 83, 84 decibels there. You go towards the back, cymbal booths were 90 and above, drum sets 98 and above. Uh, really, the hall had an average of around 90 decibels all the way yeah. through. Yeah, so sure. just, just being in the room is damaging. What was surprising to me is... Um, this next set of results, which was an actual session that they walked into, and uh, they didn't say which one they attended, but they note a drum beat as something they measured, which makes me think it was either world or marching or even drum set, something like that, that the playing hit 83 decibels when it was amplified. Uh, a crowd clapping is 68 <laughs> uh, a speaker at a microphone is around 73 to 78 and that um, the final performance of any session tended to be louder anywhere from 84 to 92 decibels that they went yeah, to so it's surprising yeah i know like some of the exhibition hall is not surprising in one bit you know that's why yeah. they hand out earplugs at the door um right. but it is surprising how loud a particular session was because we have complete control over that. Everything's amplified. Why was it so freaking loud? Um, well, I think that, I think that I, I can guarantee you there are other sessions that were louder than that. Um, oh, there have remember, been, right? I remember a few where I was in the session and put my, I always got my earplugs with me. Um, and I remember pulling them out and putting them in, in a couple of sessions at the convention. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I have to say, it, it does seem the PAS does a really good job. I know at, at this last PASIC, I was at one of the the new music performances, and you know they had these small setups that weren't getting played super loud, and they had them mic'd, and the volume was just right. Easily could have been much louder, and they even had some room. But it it does seem like they they care about this sort of thing, and I guess hence the whole hearing room and earplugs. Oh, well, yeah, the hearing tests. And this year, more people took the test than ever before. Almost 200 people got their hearing tested, um, well, which is I, great. I know being involved with the new music committee and stuff like that, too, a lot of it depends on who the engineer is in the rooms at different times. Like the Jerry, the engineer that they've worked with for the Focus Day forever, has a really good sense now of how to handle that room and the types of pieces that are performed in that room and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that you're necessarily going to have that level in all of the other myriad of rooms that are going on in use through the convention or something too. Sure. That's a good point. Yeah. Wow. Well, great. Thanks, Laurel. And I'm sorry you had to do that with the cold. <laughs> I'm sorry. I totally have smelly cat voice right now. <laughs> <laughs> So I apologize for how I sound. <laughs> Tracy, you, you mentioned while we were getting ready that um, your drumline, it's required to use earplugs. Is, was that something in place before you got there? Or what, do, no. do you know what, what, what was the tipping point that made them decide to mandate that? Because I, I think that's great, of course. It's actually, it's something I started doing actually at my previous job. Um, 
and it was there was there's another podcast called the Marching Roundtable that is very popular in the marching side of the world because my my career is weird because I really live very much in both the marching and the concert orchestral world like full time in both. Um, and so they did a podcast that was entirely about hearing and stuff. And the, what the statistic that struck me was that they, the audiologist they worked with said that in a marching drum line, like someone just playing a marching snare drum, the safe threshold of time for them to listen to a marching snare drum, I'm protected, was like five seconds or something like that. At which point immediately you go into like the damage range. Sure. Wow. And when I heard a statistic like that, I'm like, why are we not making making them do this? Um, and it's actually it's become a thing. A lot of the WGI lines are requiring it now. Um, I know the Cavaliers, they will not even let you audition for the group if you're not wearing hearing protection. Um, a lot of the groups are starting to sell the earplugs themselves at their souvenir stands and everything. Um, and so what I did is I just, I got it put into our fees and everything that one of the things we do at the beginning of the year is we buy hearing protection for everybody in the section. Um, you know, and it's not just the drum line too. I mean, we've got this huge front ensemble that's up in the front of the field with the entire marching band playing straight into their ears and everything. Um, so we have them wear it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what a lot of the guys in the line have found is that they can hear cleanliness more easily with the hearing protection in because their ears are not tweaked and maxed out, you know, and because, you know, at a certain point, we all know with loud volumes, your ears just kind of shut down out of almost self-preservation. And so what they found is that in the drum line, they could actually hear how like the vertical alignment of everything they were playing more easily with the, with the earplugs in too. Sure. So it's not only aiding them to not be deaf by the time they're 20, um, but it also helps them to play better. Um, and what I found is that with a lot of the students, that has started to flow into other things that they do. Like I've got students here now that, I walk past them. They've constantly got the earplugs there ready to go. If they're going into a practice room or a band rehearsal or anything like that, we've got a lot more students that because they got used to wearing them are starting to wear them much more often now. Yeah, I think um, for me, one, one of the things I, I drive into my students is getting a big sound out of every instrument. Um, and I think especially people don't generally wear earplugs when they play timpani or marimba um, because to us, I guess, because they're lower frequencies, they seem softer. Um, but for me, even when I play at a soft dynamic on marimba, it hurts my ears if I don't wear earplugs. <laughs> um, so but one thing I noticed from doing this is that uh, I think you're you're right that you can kind of hear cleanliness better because your your ears aren't, aren't so maxed out. But I feel like it, it also by kind of hearing i guess less volume it puts me more in touch with how things feel and i can feel it much more in my wrists if i'm being tense or not when i'm wearing earplugs i find oh interesting well i know like because you know nancy zeltzman talks about how she started that program that she's doing now with the screen and everything like that was partially a reaction to hearing loss could you what what program is that because i've never heard of this it's the program she does now where she's got like the photography from. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, the Soto Voce program or whatever it is that she's yeah. doing. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was at Pembroke, that was one of the first schools that she did that pr program at. And what she told me was that that was partially in reaction to, she couldn't, her hearing couldn't handle the louder volumes of a lot of the stuff anymore. Um, and so she had found herself, tending much more towards quieter pieces and things like that. Um, but I mean, I, at my clinic at PASIC, I advocated for wearing hearing protection even when playing timpani, because we all know that when you're in the back of a professional orchestra, that can become, I mean, if you're playing Bernstein or something like that, that is a brutally loud yeah. environment. And there becomes a lot of diminishing returns at even how clearly you can hear pitch. 
at that volume. You know, if you're playing something that's got a myriad of tuning changes and everything. Um, so I've been talked about, you know, there'll be times now I'm, I can't say I do it every time I'm playing in an orchestra, you know, if we're playing like Mozart or something like that, I might not be doing it, but any of the big pieces I'm tending much more often to put hearing protection in now. Hmm. How long did I was going to ask you, you to get, um, Oh, sorry. Hun. No, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask how long it took you to get used to. Um, the difference in sound, like losing, because you certainly lose some of the quality. Right. And yeah, with marimba, it doesn't bother me for some reason. But I remember, right. you know, undergrad marching band, it was so weird to get used to playing snare drum right. with earplugs. Yeah. So how long did it take you? Um, it's still, it's still, it's always, it's still an adjustment period, even when I do it sometimes, um, especially depending on what instrument I'm playing. Um, I find that the adjustments more noticeable, um, and I do use. I've got custom fit plugs, so I've got like the good musicians plugs, which really are more like turning the volume down rather than losing more, losing a lot of the tone and stuff like that. I see. Um, and so that I think, I think the quality of the earplugs does help a lot too because if you've got one that is fit to your ear and everything you you don't notice so much of the changing of the sound it's just like the volume's been reduced some right and that, that was actually going to be my question was what uh, what earplug do you use because i was going to say you know i have a tub of these things right. you guys have seen you know yeah. and they just block out everything right. <laughs> it's like very little you can hear yeah. but um, I also have, yeah, like the audiologist created the ones that lower all the frequencies equally. And of course they shoot the gunk in your ear and mold it to your ear. And yeah, those are, those are really great and are yeah, cheaper I, I than they've ever been around in case. Like if I put mine in my pocket and take them home and forget them, or like if a student shows up to a drum set lesson and doesn't, you know, forgot their earplugs or whatever, I can, you know, can just give those out. Yeah. So yeah, I, think, I mean, yeah. it, the ones we buy for the drum line are the Edimodic earplugs okay because they have a thing that's called the adopt a band program um like yes yep. yeah and what you do like is that. if you do the adopt a band program if you buy because we buy them in bulk for the whole line that reduces the price on yeah them. you know so you're getting them for like ten dollars a pair or something like that at that point um so and we bought those but the other ones that i know a lot of people that really love and i have used these before too are the ear racers mm -hmm. um those are i think from what i've seen the best of the earplugs that are not the custom fit um i think they're the best ones that you can just buy off the shelf um they they seem to have the best they seem to do the best job of balancing the sound of any of the more commercial ones if you're not going to get a custom earplug okay yeah well great you know you guys speaking of um symphonic playing i bumped into a pretty cool little quote on new music box and this is written by andrew norman on being named composer of the year by musical america so it's a pretty short little article but i just want to read you one of the quotes from it um something he said so from new music box andrew norman on being named composer of the year by musical america he says we all in this room have the power to shape what classical music is and will be for future generations we are not just the inheritors and interpreters of a tradition. We are also the definers of that tradition. We have the responsibility to pass on an art form that is broader, more inclusive, and more socially engaged than the one we inherited. So for those of you in this room, particularly those of you involved in the highest levels of symphony orchestra world, excuse me, the symphony orchestra world, the next time you program another 19th century symphony or concerto or overture, because it is there, because it's a good piece, because it's familiar and your audience will sit politely through it, just think about what you're giving up by doing so. You are giving up the chance to say something meaningful, important, thought-provoking, necessary, and specific about our own time. You are giving up the chance to give a voice to a person, an experience, 
a point of view that we don't already have in the concert hall. You are giving up the chance to make the canon we will pass on less white, less male, less Eurocentrical homogeneous, and more representative of the diverse, multifaceted world in which we live. So congrats to Andrew Norman, of course. And also, I want to just say that's really cool that he takes a, uh, a, a, a platform like that and says something that he thinks is more broadly important rather than just talk about himself. Um, but it's a pretty cool quote. What do you guys think of that quote? <laughs> no one wants to talk first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can call on somebody. <laughs> well, as the I'll host. bite. I'll, I'll bite. <laughs> Go, Ben. Um, I this is what usually I, happens. I say something, nobody bites. <laughs> the the way the way that he worded it, it's interesting because it sounds like, and maybe this is the case for some people, but it sounds like he's inferring that some people just pick a piece because it's there and, oh, let me grab a Mozart and put it on my program. And for me, like, every single concert I've ever presented, um, I've had a mix of, and you know, granted, solo percussionist or, you know, percussion ensemble, we have a little more flexibility than an orchestra, but... Every single piece I've presented, I've chosen specifically for some sort of reason. Um, and in short, I guess it's that I like the piece. <laughs> um, but then I think it's also, it's it's important to represent old and new music. Um, because some, like, some new music people seem to want to throw Beethoven completely out the window. Um, and I think Beethoven re- wrote great music and we should still listen to Beethoven. And, um, I, and I should interrupt you for just a second and say that Andrew does say that also in the little bits that's above and below gotcha. this. He does yeah, say the fine. classics are wonderful. They're real important also. Yeah. Um, so just to, yeah, yeah be but, fair to yeah, him. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it, can, it can be interesting to curate a program. Um, it, it's actually a lot like a cheese tasting <laughs> So uh, I've heard about <laughs> cheese tasting. You can sample, for example, the same cheese at different ages or the same cheese from different regions of the world or something like that. So you could do a compo- you know, a, a, a concert of works that you know expanded upon form going from Beethoven all the way through John Cage or something like that. Can the analogy um, be a beer tasting for this podcast? <laughs> I don't drink beer, but I'm oh, sure that's right. Okay. Similar. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. That's right. Um. But yeah, so I think I think it's um, I think that the point is that people oftentimes maybe haphazardly pick pieces um, for no reason other than they like them without thinking about how the concert as a whole would fit together. Um, and so instead of ever, I, I don't know, because like all of our concerts are kind of potpourris. It's pretty rare, with the exception of like Focus Day, that we'll actually have a themed concert or something like that. I mean, my percussion ensemble concerts certainly are potpourri concerts so yeah i don't know i kind of rambled for a bit but i think i got some points across there (laughs) yeah well and i know it's not it's not something that needs to be rehashed but it it just came up recently and uh, tracy what do you think yeah i mean i think well that was profound um yeah (laughs) i I think we have a lot of roles that we have to do i mean the part of what we have to do is we do have to maintain and present the canon. Um, but I think that beyond the can- the canonical works, we don't know what, what pieces and repertoire and everything is still going to make kind of that lasting mark. And so I think beyond that, it's our job to try to find as wide a range of new things as we can. And I think a lot of that does involve bringing in um, you know, new faces, new sounds, new voices to everything. So I think that I, I know I feel like I'm probably kind of like walking the middle of the road here, but I think we do have, we do, especially in today's environment and stuff like that, we do kind of have a responsibility to try to find those other people that are out there. Um, you know, I don't think, I don't think we can, I don't think there's a way for us to be too diverse at this point with what we're doing, um, especially at this point in time. And I mean, having three daughters, I become very, very aware of a lot of these things from the perspective of how women are treated and stuff like that. 
even as young as they are. I see, you know, already some of those things that, well, you can't do that because you're a girl and stuff already starting, you know, with, you know, up to an 11 year old. And so I think that we have to, I do think it's a little bit of our responsibility to go out and find those, find the different people, the different composers and stuff like that. We can bring new things to the table. What well, what are some of those things? I mean, if you don't mind, um, just because it, it, it reminds me of our, our episode with Elizabeth Blair and specifically female composers, what, what are some of those things that well, I you think, see like even little girls are told very young you can't do? Well, I mean, the whole, unfortunately, there's still the stereotyping of, you know, when it comes to math, science. Some of those things um, with girls being told that they're not going to be as good at those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, the the idea that there's certain instruments that then this one really gets in my craw that there's certain instruments that girls can or can't play. And you see it on the flip side, too, with, I mean, boys being told, you know, get, boys don't play flute and things like that. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of that still exists right now as sad as it is um you know or the whole the philosophy and i'm sure that we've all heard this before the old school guys play drums and girls play bells idea right you know and it's sadly a lot of that still exists sure so yeah and uh, we were just having, oh, this is a little sideline, but in the group chat, I was trying to think, I was like, I don't know how many works by female composers I've programmed on percussion ensemble concerts. I need to get on that. But anyway, um, Casey, you've brought up a point before about uh, a lot of people will play a piece or look into a composer just um, just so that they can say they did. Sort of like a, a lot of people want to play Bone Alphabet just because... It's Bone Alphabet, man. <laughs> a lot of people um, not play Bone Alphabet. <laughs> yeah, and I think that uh, that like as it's it's a fine line to walk because as a student, of course, you want to touch on repertoire that pushes your boundaries, puts you out of your comfort zone, discovers you know you discover new things about yourself. But at the same rate, um, you know, like last two episodes ago, when we were talking with Steve Schick. It's like Dave Weckl is not programming Bone Alphabet, and it would be super weird if he did because that's not dave weckle um right. yeah so yeah i think it's it's a it's also a fine line to walk between being a student and putting on a professional concert of are you doing this just to say you did or do you really feel a connection with this piece and i think and i think you have to have that that has to be an aspect of it too i mean you don't i don't think you can go out and go well i'm going to program this person's piece just because they're a woman or because they're from this different culture or something like that i don't think because I don't think they would want that to be the reason why their piece was getting programmed. I, yeah, yeah. I think that you do have to find someone that does have a connection to it and everything. But I think that um, you know that that is an aspect. I think as a teacher too, we have to be aware of that kind of thing because our students are picking up whatever our biases as far as repertoire and everything like that are. That's that's inherent in the teacher student relationship and stuff. And so if our students come in and they notice that, wow, we never ever do a piece by, you know, from this culture or anything like that, then they're going to go out and that's not going to be a thing that they're going to think about trying to do either. So. Yeah. Yeah. Laurel, did you have something? Yeah. I have a lot of, um, yeah, various thoughts yeah. on everything that's been, said recently um to in line with what tracy was saying about you know his daughters and what they're told i remember being young and almost all of my girlfriends being in girl scouts and my apologies to anyone listening who's in girl scouts but i thought girl scouts was so lame i wanted <laughs> to be in boy scouts because they did archery and they yeah. learned how to survive in the woods and stuff and i wanted to do that and i wanted to go to their camp not to the girl scout camp and I remember asking my parents, like, can't I be in Joseph's Boy Scout troop? Joseph is my brother, everyone listening. Um, you know, and they were like, I don't, I don't think so, honey. No, I don't. And I was like, what? And so every time we dropped him off at summer camp, I would just like look around at this place and be like, I want to be here. <laughs> um, Meanwhile, Joseph really wanted to go sell some cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> do you remember? Do you remember South Park when Kenny has to pick between shop or home ec, and he chooses yeah. home ec because he's scared of the power tools, and all they teach you in home ec is, okay, girls, here's how you find out if a man has credit card or not. Look at his shoes. <laughs> look at uh, <laughs> and it's all just BS. Right. <laughs> it's funny. Well, oh. and I am. Um, yeah. Anyway, and, and to to get back to the um, the quote, Casey, about you know, programming new music Thank intentionally you. or not. I think, um, yeah, you and I talked about this for quite a bit. Was it this morning? I don't know. Um, yeah, on the one hand, it's like, well, good music is, it's written by humans, meant to be heard by humans. It's about humanity. It's always relevant, no matter how old it is. It's always relevant, whatever emotion is contained in it. Um, yeah, but on the other hand, our... It's like our, our general, uh, it's like our level of tolerance of what we say music can be or what art can be changes. You know, like Mozart said, music must always be pleasurable no matter what it's expressing. And of course, you know, we know 200 years later, we have completely kind of left that by the wayside at this point. Um, and we accept different things as musical. And when thinking about this quote, um, I guess Newman is talking about those who program music, but I get to thinking about the performers. And um, with my friend Marianne, we have a duo together. She's a pianist. And so she encounters many uh, pianists who only play up to Brahms. That's what they do. Or they maybe go up to, you know, like uh, uh, Rachmaninoff and that's it. And they don't have to play anything else. Quite frankly, they can be successful and only play that. And then there are um, pianists like her that are trained in that, but are really interested in new music. And she premieres works and she's always collaborating with different people. And yeah, part of me, yeah, I, I just heard it about the performers. And I know I'm one that leans towards, I want to know what's being said today because our, um, our levels of, like discourse of conversation about certain topics have changed a lot, you know, even in the last like 20, 30 years. And I'm interested to see, yeah, just what people around today can make and can do yeah, with those things. So that was a lot of information. Sorry. Yeah. Migraine brain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad he said it. And I feel like this little battle has, I'm not, of course I'm no expert, but I thought it's, this is how it's kind of always been, you know, pe people make these new pieces and they get a lot of criticism and the audience complains and the donors complain, Oh, we want to hear the old thing and we want to hear the traditional stuff. And it does seem, and this goes back to our episode with Tony Cerrone, we're talking about the Philly riots and the Pittsburgh riots. It seems like, uh, Riots. Why did I say riots? Uh, what did I mean? Uh, pro, um, strikes. <laughs> thank you. Strikes. Jeez. Um, you're, yeah. Strikes. Um, it seems like it's part of the natural ebb and flow. And that, um, I don't know, when something is institutionalized to this level, the rep has a lot to do with that. I mean, the progression of the rep grew up along with the growing up of what symphony orchestra is today. I mean, the numbers of dollars they were striking over, they're really, really big numbers, you know? And, and as far as, you know, you hear people say all the time, like, oh, they're playing more dead white guy stuff. I, I mean, how many times have you actually sat through all of Beethoven five? You know, I hear that all the time, like, oh, I don't need to hear Beethoven 5 again. I, I want to say, like, wait, how many times have you actually heard it, like, all the way through with, like, your full attention? I mean, I, I, I definitely know that entire piece, but I think I've honestly listened to it from start to finish once or twice. And I've it seen it live that, like, more than once or twice. But, I mean, I think I've watched the complete s series of loss more times than I've actually heard all of Beethoven 5. Yeah, I was just, it's, it's funny <laughs> you know? when, like, when you hear like a middle movement of a Beethoven symphony and you're like, I know this is Beethoven, but... Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can't pick it out of a lineup. <laughs> 
Right. Like I, I think, and I get what he's saying. And again, I think it needs to be said because that's part of the natural ebb and flow. And that's how, you know, the rite of spring has become one of the classics. Now it had so much, re- it's the like classic example of resistance piece of music that's turned the corner and now it's, you know, everyone wants to hear it. Um, so yeah, we need to be saying that, but I kind of d- just basically disagree. It's like, no, I think there's so much to Beethoven nine, and I think there's so much to Mahler five. I I I could hear it several more times. You know, like how many people actually are like listening to that whole thing too many times? Yeah, and I think I mean it's the thing. I spend a lot of time doing like really really out there stuff i mean that's kind of a lot of the repertoire that i've done and everything but yeah. you won't see me geek out any more than when one of my students starts bach right because well, and that's how good modernists every- are that's how good yeah. modern composers and performers yeah. are they know they know everything and and the, you know classic example again it's like dolly Picasso, Matisse, they're like classically trained artists. They can do the classical thing. They didn't they didn't fast forward through all the tradition and just go straight to the abstract. Sorry, I, inter- I interrupted you. Sorry. No, that's fine. And I just because every time we come back to Bach, I find something new. Yeah. Even if it's a movement or a suite or something like that that I've taught tons of times, there'll always be a moment when we're working on it that I'm suddenly like Holy crap, I've never thought of that before. Check this out. Look at this, you know. Um, you know, and your modernist, you know, like Zappa, who also, I mean, Zappa was another one that was a very well versed, knowledgeable musician about a lot more than just what most people know Frank Zappa for doing. Um, yeah. Well, and and Laurel and, and I did this. Well, I guess it was technically your clinic, Laurel, but we ended up kind of doing it together. Um, pr- presentation to composers on writing for marimba and they're all pretty young composers i m- don't think any of them had written for marimba before um, or maybe not but specifically I, d- I guess i don't know that specifically but they were all very young and th- the questions were like so what hap- what does the resonator sound like if you hit it what happens if you strike the key with a you know, a bowling ball. And what happens if you take the marimba and drop it on the floor? And they're like immediately fast forwarding to the avant-garde. Can you get out funny overtones? Right. Yeah. That was one of the questions. Like, so what harmonics can you get from? And we, our response was kind of like, can you just write for it? Can you, can, can you just write for it? Yeah. Like really like all this craftsmanship and all this, these years of tradition trying to perfect what it sounds like, just trying to get the rosewood to make the right pitches, mm-hmm. um, all those years of hard work, and you, you're already fast-forwarding to you know, the abstract, and you already want to... <laughs> I want to skip all of what Picasso did before and just start with his cubism. It's kind of... It's kind of bullshit, you know? Well, and I, I see that. I mean, we, we have a pretty active composer, composition program here right now. And we, yeah, and Sam or Sears, of, right? Yeah, Sam or Sears. And yeah. so a lot of them, you know, so a lot of them write for percussion and stuff like that. So we ended up, end up interacting with them a lot. And what we see is you've either got the ones that are very scared to kind of go outside the box. So they write in a very sort of traditional style. And then you've got the ones that without knowing anything whatsoever about the instrument, want to skip to what are all of the weird, bizarre things that I can do with it. And a lot of times we're like, why don't you just write for the instrument that's there first, learn how that works, how that sound goes. And then you can start trying to think about doing other things because you wouldn't think, I don't think that they would do that if they were writing for like piano. They're not right. going to first thing out of the box be like, okay, let me write for, for some prepared piano. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, good call on the term prepared piano because <laughs> Ben, what are you going to tell us? You gonna, what do you got? A dead white guy to talk about? A dead white guy, yes. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> and speaking of like this You're whole bigot, like, notion of like you have to master everything that came before before you can invent something new, this composer also breaks that rule. <laughs> about today is uh we we previously kind of gave a little bio of the first part of john cage's life um but i wanted to talk about 
a particular piece by John Cage today, which is the third construction. Um, and to kind of get there, we have to go by way of the first and second construction. So we'll take a little journey there. Um, but if anyone's interested in more information on this, I just had a couple resources. One is I came across an Italian percussionist named Paolo Paralini, um, who has a really, really good blog. It's in English. Um, and he, he has a lot of great blog entries kind of for, you know, teaching, uh, younger students all the way up to how to prepare the marimba part for Barrio's Linnea. Um, so really good stuff there. And then the premiere concert for the third construction, which we'll get to again, uh, there's a book called Perspectives on American Music 1900 to 1950, which was mm -hmm. edited by Michael Saffel. And that has some uh, very interesting stuff about the premiere concert for this. So, but anyway, um, getting on to the piece. With these constructions, uh, John Cage was uh, interested for a very long time in musical form, large scale form of musical works. Um, and like many composers, Beethoven's a great example. He expanded form, expanded sonata form to the point where it almost didn't look like sonata form. Um, and Cage was interested in creating a form that would be useful in writing for percussion instruments. And just about all musical forms up until the 20th century uh, were interested in long scale harmonic progression. Sonata form being a great example where you have the two themes, then you have the development, they're kind of mixed up, and then you come back to the home key and, and the recap and so on. Um, but Cage was, you know, looking at non-pitched percussion instruments and saying trying to, you know, force a sonata form to work for percussion instruments doesn't really make sense. Um, so he developed what he called micro macrocosmic rhythmic structure, um, or Lou Harrison had, I think, a more succinct name for it called square root formula. Um, but basically the way that this square root formula works is that you'll have a certain number. So let's use the number 16. Your piece will have 16 sections in it. Each of those sections is 16 bars long. And then there's some sort of structure within each of the 16 bar structures. For example, four bars, three bars, two bars, three bars, four bars. That adds up to 16. Um, and then that form is represented in the whole composite form of four sections, three sections, two sections, three sections, four sections. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but like I said, that's called the square root formula. And basically it's the microstructure is an extension, or not an extension, is a representation of the large form structure. Is that making sense what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I anyway, this, uh, this square root formula was used by Cage and several of his compositions, um, including the three uh, constructions. The first construction, which was composed in 1939, um, was a strict square root formula piece. It's uh, the number for this piece is 16. And it's actually that that sequence I just described of four, three, two, three, four. It's kind of a palindrome is the structure for the piece. So every 16 bars, there is a four bar phrase, a three bar phrase, two bar phrase, three bar phrase, four bar phrase. And then the whole piece is also structured four, three, two, three, four. Um, and then the second construction, uh, very similar. Um, and by the way, the first construction, I should say first construction in metal, all the instruments are metallic in that one. Um, the second construction was very similar in its use of the 16 bar, 16 section square root formula. Um, the numbers for that one were four, three, four, five. Um, so almost a palindrome again. Um, but then anyway, by the time Cage got to the third construction, um, I don't know if you've gotten bored with that or what, but it's slightly different. So the third construction, it's based on a 24 bar, 24 section form. Um, and actually within each of the uh, players, each part, so to speak, the the number of measures permutates, uh, rotates around. It's the same number, but it it spins, if that makes sense. So maybe if I say it like this, player four has an eight bar, two bar, four bar, five bar, three bar, two bar structure. Player one is that same order, but rotated one to the right. So instead of the eight bars, two bars, four bars at the beginning, it starts with two bars, then eight bars, two bars, four bars, and so on. So it rotates player four, player one, three, two. It rotates that series of bars, which hopefully we can put some sort of video overlay that will explain this a little better. <laughs> 
you can you can uh, go ahead and submit that to the editor, and the editor yeah. will do that <laughs> we'll do for it. you. But I don't uh, know but if anyway, the editor is up for making that. I'm just piece, say. Uh, is eight sections, two sections, five sections, four sections, five sections. So it's not a strict square root formula piece, um, but it's loosely based on the square root formula. Um, each of the four players has an array of different instruments, which I kind of tried to, instead of just rattling off all the instruments, I wanted to come up with some way of describing it. So here's what I came up with. All four players have uh, a set of five cans, three toms, and claves. Um, that is universal. Every single person has those same exact instruments played with fingers or sticks. Um, then every single player has some sort of sustained shaker. So in order, players one through four have a Northwest Indian rattle, an Indo-Chinese rattle, which is supposed to be anklung, a tambourine, and a tin can with tacks. Every single player also has a high-low pitch set. So player one has teponaxle, which is a Native American log drum. Two, uh, player two has two cowbells. Player three has cricket collars. And player four has maracas. Um, everyone has what I call it an uninterrupted sustain instrument in order again, players one through four, Chinese cymbal, lion's roar, conch, and bass drum roar, which is bass lion's roar basically. Um, and then all of the players except for player two have what I called rough sounds. So player one has maracas, player three has quijada, and player four has a ratchet. Um, so that's the, the sort of instrument breakdown. Um, if you're curious about this piece, there are some, it's one of those rare pieces. There are some just multiple amazing YouTube recordings. There's a YouTube recording of Nexus. Um, there's a YouTube recording of Amadinda, which is my favorite. Um, there's a YouTube recording of So Percussion where they kind of talk about the piece. Is it So or Third Coast? I think it's So. I'll probably get into trouble for that. Um, somewhere third there's, coast, there's, but somewhere there's third actually coast, a recording yeah. of So Percussion doing it without instruments. It was like yeah. a, a talk, and they like just seeing all of the parts. Yeah. Um, and then there's also, I found a couple recordings by some uh, younger percussion ensembles. One, I think one's out of Baylor. Uh, there's two recordings, at least, of people doing it from memory, um, which is insane to me. <laughs> um, so anyway... Uh, this piece was uh, written at the end of John Cage's West Coast period. Um, so, like I said, it was, it was written and premiered in 1941, and he moved uh, to Chicago later in that same year. I think around September of 1941, he moved to Chicago. Um, the premiere occurred on uh, Wednesday, May 14th, 1941, at 8.30 p.m., uh, which was Lou Harrison's birthday, actually. And if you look at that book, the uh, Perspectives on American Music, it actually has the the program, the like a scanned in version of the program uh, in that book. Um, it was premiered at the California Club Auditorium. I love the ticket prices were listed on the program. It was fifty cents for a ticket or twenty five cents for students, <laughs> uh, which is amazing. <laughs> Uh, they, the, the program also listed, there was decor by Xenia Cage, who was John Cage's wife at the time. Uh, she built a large mobile that hung above the stage and sort of almost was like a dancer above the stage. Um, and, uh, the program was, uh, it received sort of unex I, I would call unexpectedly sort of good reviews. Um, people seemed to at, le at least sort of get what they were going for. They weren't comparing it to a symphony concert of Brahms and Beethoven, um, and the concert overall eliminated conventional instruments, including timpani, xylophone, and snare drum. Um, and Lou Harrison was quoted as saying, who could afford timpani? And besides, none of us could roll, which I love that that's like a constraint in a lot of the early Harrison and Cage pieces is that the, the performers playing them weren't able to roll. <laughs> so they, they didn't write rolls. Um, so this program, it consisted of seven works. Um, it was all Harrison and Cage pieces. Uh, there was Lou Harrison's Song of Quetzalcoatl, uh, Cage's Quartet, Harrison's Canticle, Cage's Third Construction, Harrison's 13th Symphony, Cage's Trio, and Cage and Harrison's Double Music. Um, the Harrison Song of Quetzalcoatl, Cage's Third Construction, Harrison's 13th Symphony, and Double Music were all premieres on this concert. And the performers for the third construction were Xenia Cage, who the piece is dedicated to for their anniversary, Doris Dennison, uh, Lou Harrison, Mar Margaret Jansen, and it was conducted by John Cage. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, third construction. I was fortunate enough to play this piece during my master's degree, and it's one of those pieces where 
if you ever have the chance to play it, jump on it because it's an unbelievable experience and also very difficult. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah uh, Tracy, the, the reason I did this is I know, Tracy, you have a recording of this on YouTube, and I would imagine that probably Casey and Laurel have performed it at some point. I've done it, yeah. I have not. It's, it's one of my favorite pieces in like the entire percussion repertoire. Yeah, I mean, that's easy to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, just because there's there's just so much to it. Um, it's just so phenomenally compositionally developed and the way that all of the rhythms and everything piece together and stuff. Um, and I talk about this a lot, too, that I think this actually, again, going to the fact that I deal with a lot of marching percussion stuff, this piece, I think, actually had a lot of effect on what we hear in marching percussion nowadays. Um, because of the way that rhythmic structures are used in drumline writing and stuff, but also the way he uses the rhythmic cadences in the pieces where he's like either speeding up or slowing down as he yeah, comes yeah. kind of the cadential point. Listen to any marching show when they get to the end of a phrase. What does the drumline start to do when they get to that musical point? Yeah, and it's yeah. The, he uses a lot of like five lits at the end of a phrase. Right. Go one, two, three, four, five, one, and really land. And yeah, it does sound like marching percussion. Now that you mention it, yeah. so I actually I think that a lot of where that idea came from may. I mean, I can't say I haven't done the research to say that it actually dates back to there. But if you think about the percussionists that are doing a lot of that writing and everything, have grown up playing that repertoire and hearing that when you get to a big sort of cadential point in a piece that happens with the rhythmic structure i think that there might be some sort of influence there so wow great yeah, it is one of those pieces you know speaking of laurel's topic and then my little rant about you know <laughs> the classical composers i always feel like beethoven like ben said you can tell you're listening to beethoven you know there's this there's this kind of that just it's the orchestration of it you know, you just know that that's the combination you're hearing. I feel like the, the third constructions in third construction in particular has this sound environment that, with the rattles and the cans and the the claves, it just seems like it is a um, I don't know. It, it it has a certain like stamp on it. Yeah, it's a it's a certain. You could write many it. pieces in that same medium if you wanted to. But I I think the the thing that's interesting for me though is that the the parameters for the instruments are very loosely defined um so he says cans but there are cans that are this big and there are cans that are this big sure, and the amadinda point. recording one of the things i like about it is they use like vastly you know a, a huge array of sizes of cans for example or drums or something like that um but it's interesting every single recording you hear I mean, it sounds like the third construction it doesn't sound like something completely foreign but you know any two beethoven performances other than maybe tempo sound really similar Whereas two third construction performances sound radically different based on the instrument's use. Well, and I, I, sorry, I, and when I did my master's at New Mexico with Chris Schultes, who's like one of the best known Cage experts around, one of the things I remember him saying is that Cage wanted that sort of freedom because he wanted every performance of the piece, even though it is very heavily structured as far as like the rhythm and everything it can still sound unique to every group that's playing it. Yeah. So a Mexican, like uh, like Tambuco, if they play at the Mexican ensemble, the instrumentation that they're going to use, if they're using more Latin-flavored instruments and stuff like that, it's going you know, to sound very different than maybe if Amadinda does it or something like that. Um, and I think that I think that's one of the thing. I think that's one of the other things that's brilliant about it, is you could put Third Coast and their giant table of all the instruments in the middle of it that they put all of their stuff on next to so percussion and it's the exact same piece but it still has a different and unique sound to it as they do it yeah do you guys have enough air to do the conch shell as it's written <laughs> i did i did not have the privilege of playing that part but i i love when the conch comes in it sounds <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> he actually brought, the last time I did this, we actually brought one of our brass teachers in to work with the person that had the conch shell. Well, um, well and you know what? When, when I was a student, I did I did it at Rice University. My friend Grant Biner played it, and he was dating a horn player at the time, and she came in and showed us how to do it. So we all, you know, we wanted to all learn how to do it, but I don't think I could ever successfully 
um, get the whole rhythm out with the good the sound you're yeah, supposed to get yeah. just not enough air i mean i'm sure if i took it home and worked on it for a month it one, might happen one thing i i wonder about i don't i don't know if it was nexus that invented this but a lot of people do like the bend and pitch on the conch shell and that's not written on the part i think like nexus added that and a lot of people picked it up i like it but i think uh when i did it uh Mersh didn't care for the pitch bend so I think it's just overblowing, right? Like, like on a real. No, you, you like blow your pitch hand into right? the shell. You can't change the pitch. Oh, okay. With their there's, hand. There's some people that do it, and then there's some people that play it very straight. So, uh, but yeah, none of that's actually really in the score. Man, well, Tracy, thank you so much for joining us, and congrats on your new baby, man. That's fantastic. Thanks. She's awesome. She's eight months now. So, <laughs> well, good of you to take the time to visit us, and it's great Almost to see us always. Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my oldest does archery. She like takes archery lessons, and she got a bow for Christmas and everything. She's pretty hardcore into it. So, yeah, cool. <laughs> great. Hey, uh, Laurel, Ben, thanks a lot. And um, yeah, guys, catch you on seventy six. Oh, little update iTunes is back online. Blogspot is all back online. So thanks to Laurel for doing that. Uh, as promised, the new year has begun and all that stuff's up to date. So, okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs>